Hallelujah. Okay. It's all right. Uh, thank you so much for preparing our hearts, our praise team and our choir. And I pray our Father God is on, enthroned above praises. And as we sing together, I pray that Father will be enthroned over our hearts. So he will be the true king who rules over our lives. Amen. Okay. Today I'd like to share grace with you through a message entitled, The Truth Versus Lies. So we can start the PowerPoint, please. The truth versus lies. Okay. You see, there is one truth here and all lies. Right? And indeed, we live in this world that's flooded with information. So much information. So much knowledge. And it's flooding us. So will you be ready when this erupts? Would you be able to discern what is the truth in the midst of all this knowledge and information? To discern what is the truth and what are the lies, we have to have the good standard, which is called canon, a measurement, right? What is the standard in your life that you use to discern what is the truth and what are the lies? I pray it is the Bible. Okay. Well, the Bible is a magnificent book. It's not just a history book. It's a book that contains God's promise and God's prophecy. It is said there are more than 30,000 prophecies in the Bible. They all came true. Now, most important thing is that the Bible declares the end. What's going to happen as an individual or as a universe? It declares the end from the very beginning. That's why we always refer back to the ancient history. Our praise today um, choir saying the, the most ancient one, right? right? So by studying what happened in the beginning, we are able to be ready to cope with what's going to happen in the future, okay? Or in the end time. Well, the beginning, the most beginning that we know in the Bible is a place called the Garden of Eden. Okay. Now, let's traverse back into the time Okay, and go to Eden and remember what God did. The Eden is a big, large area, region, right? Now, the Garden of Eden is different. Garden actually means a fence. So God, in this region called Eden, put a fence around like this. Right? He put a fence around the Garden of Eden. Why do you put fence around a region? To protect from invaders, right? What do you think is the invader? And we know the history, we know the fact already, right? What invaded the Garden of Eden? God says, be careful, cultivate it and keep it, right? Shamar, protect it, guard it from an invader. What is the invader? Children, watch out. <laughs> the serpent came, right? Now, is this the real snake that we're talking about? No, right? Well, we're learning about the beginning so that we know what's happening now and what will happen in the end. Then what are we protecting from? We have to know the enemy, right? What is the serpent? I propose to you, the serpent represents lies. Lies. Okay. Well, God gave this word to Adam, right? Do you remember what it is? You can't eat freely from all the trees in the garden except the one tree, right? The one that's in the center. And he said, do not eat it because the day you eat it, you will 
surely die. That is the absolute truth. However, this serpent comes and he twists the word around. Okay, so let's take a look at this. How did he flip the truth of God? He said, you will surely not die. But let's take a look at this. Which sounds better to you? You will die. No, you will surely not die. Are you ready? Will you be ready to discern the truth versus lies? The lies will sound better to us. That's what the Bible is telling us. The truth may hurt. Here, we can imagine God's angry face, right? The stern voice of God. You will surely die. Who wants to hear that? Right? But let's, let me ask this. Which carries more love? Can you feel that love? This is all about my relationship with father, right? The moms, you know, well, mom's here. <laughs> Always say no, right? But we children want to hear yes. And we follow our friends because our friends always agree with us. For example, right? Which cares more love? No always comes because of love. Are we tuned in within our communication with God and be able to discern that when he says sternly, you will die, that we accept it as a truth and the rest of it is a lie? Are we ready for this? On top of that, serpent will propose this to you. You will be like God. This can be very confusing because we learn every day we have to take up God's image and likeness, right? We resemble God because we are his children, like any son takes after the father. But here, serpent uses that, and he says, you will be like God. And guess what happens? The moment she accepted this, the moment she accepted what sounds sweeter and more comfortable to her, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, in NIV version, it says the woman was convinced. Okay. She was convinced. She no longer trusted in father's stern voice, but now she's convinced. And it means she accepted as a truth of what serpent said. And guess what happened? Her attitude completely changed toward that tree that she was not supposed to take. She was convinced, and therefore now she saw the tree was beautiful. And its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted that wisdom that it would give her. We have to understand this is the way that Satan will come to us and trick us so that we will drop Father's word. Okay. And let me retranslate this passage. She saw the tree, it's so beautiful, looks so delicious, and looks so wise. And one letter that can encapsulate this whole passage, I say, is this word, I. Me. It's all about me. It looks beautiful. It looks delicious. It will make me wise. Right? There's no more voice of God. Once we filter everything for me, God's voice cannot be heard any longer. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Only I... Me, me, me. No more God's voice. Sometimes we see that um, in our own language, in English, you will hear lots of I in people who are very self-engrossed, very engrossed in oneself, okay? Or na in Korean, right? Or tega, or I. We have to carefully examine because the words we speak comes from our hearts. Okay, how much I is in my life? 
and everything becomes about me, and this is how the serpent tricks us. And this is the moment we lose the ability to hear God's voice, when everything becomes me. Okay. But what's so amazing, our Father, our one true Father, does not give up on us even when we do this. He does not abandon Adam. And when he's completely forsaken, he's completely lost, God comes again and allows him to hear his voice. And he says, I will give you the seed of the woman. What does the seed of a woman represent to you? The seed of the woman represents the one who crushed the head of the serpent who tricked me so that I no longer side with my father God. It represents um, all the evil forces that will stand in the way between me and my father. And seed of the woman will crush that. And this seed of the woman will crush all lies. And the seed is none other than Jesus Christ. That's in Galatians chapter 3. Verse 16, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Not just any seed, but one seed, and that is Jesus Christ. Again, this is Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. And also Luke chapter 8, verse 11 says, the seed is the word of God. So in other words, to Adam, who's completely lost in this battle against the truth versus lies, God says, I'm going to give you a seed of the woman, and that is the word of Jesus Christ which we have today. Okay. The truth versus lies, this battle has been ongoing from the beginning all the way to today. Shall we see? It all began in 4114 BC, the Eden, right? So there is Eden, Garden of Eden, and there's outside of Eden. You can imagine Garden of Eden is where the truth prevail. But outside of Garden of Eden is where all the rest of the knowledge, information, a.k.a. lies, will prevail. Do you see that? Do you agree with me? Okay. So there are different places. Now, when Jesus came, the true seed of the woman, there was differentiation between Jesus and the rest of the people who said who believed in God. They're called the Jews. And what's really shocking is that Jesus, when he looked at the Jews, he said, no. You say you worship God? You say your father is God? But your father is not actually God. Your father is the devil, the liar. Okay. That is in John chapter 8, verse 44. Sorry, the, um, the verse is really small. But if you turn to John chapter 8, verse 44 in NIV version, it reads this. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see, Jesus is orienting the Jews to who their father is. This is how prevalent lies are, even when Jesus was there in the midst of them. So what guarantees the same lies do not prevail us today? Okay. Well, the story will continue to go to our time and to the future, to the very end. There will be two places in this world. Jerusalem, the city of peace, which is ruled by king. Jesus Christ and his word, the absolute truth. And the other side is Babylon, okay, that is ruled by lies and the other kings of the world. Where will we belong? Are we ready to discern the truth and lies? Well, in Revelation, it talks about the king of their world, the Babylon. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says this, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, right, the one that we saw in the Garden of Eden, 
But the ancient serpent, his identity is exposed. He says, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver. Deceiver means those who lie, right? Deceiver of the whole world. So when the Satan deceives the whole world, are we going to be ready? And also Paul said the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. They are gods of this world, right? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a reality that we live in. What is blinding our minds today then? That's a very important question that we must ask ourselves. What is preventing us from seeing the truth? What causes in this world today to us, uh, causes us to be engrossed with ourselves? In other words, what provokes us to be me, 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 or I, I, I? Where do these lies come from? You might be offended by the next slide. <laughs> this is just my proposal. A social network. Okay. We live in IT world. The world is just flooded with so much information. But what is I'm not saying the social network is a devil or Satan. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying how the devil uses these inventions that humans have created. Um, you'll see, like here, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, okay? The very um, great leaders who actually started this, a lot of them have dropped out in the middle. So the leadership right now are different leadership from when they first began. The reason these leaders who have uh, created all of these great enterprise have dropped out is because they are afraid. These experts sound the alarm on their own creation. They left their own empires because they saw the dangerous impact of the social network as it is becoming a threat to humanity. One example is something called this algorithm. Algorithm, we know, like if we watch something, something that's similar is pops up, right? In whatever social network account you use, or YouTube. Algorithm is a very super smart computer that actually watches every movement that you make. It actually counts how many seconds you spent on that page, okay? Everything we do is being watched right now. So if you say, wow, the algorithm is really cool. I was just thinking about this and it pops up. That means uh, you may be in trouble because a computer knows what you're thinking, what you want. Okay. And so these experts have actually, um, there are just many um, documentaries in, in the world right now talk about this. And they say, please do not um, push pin for, uh, do you want alarm to be sent to you, for example? Okay, so we don't want to give our information, right? If you are unsatisfied with the algorithm, that means you may be doing well. You're not caught by the system. But anyways, what the algorithm does is that it only presents to you the information that you want to see. But the world is so big, you cannot know all the truth in this world, right? And because you're seeing only what you want to see, you are not able to see the big part of the world. And this creates bias. Okay, bias. So I only want to see the elephant. All my mind is filled with the elephant. And I read about the elephant, and the elephant becomes a truth. So if anyone comes around and talks to me about a donkey, that person is a nonsense. Don't you know the whole world is about elephant? And guess what happens? So anyone with a different opinion to you will become flat wrong. That is called the bias. 
This will break relationships. This will break any of um, collaboration. This will break any synergy that we can have by bringing different ideas together and work together. So here, this can work toward dividing and fracturing all of our relationships. So we cannot be one, okay? Just an important um, example is COVID. When it first came out, I don't know about Korea as much, but in America, we had just so much war. Um, we have really, the government in Korea has tight control over people, but in America, people are free to express, right? And so they say COVID is a hoax, means it's a lie. It's a, it's a, a conspiracy set by government. And I, I hate to talk about my family member again, but my brother was against. He's like, this is just a cool, then it's gonna go away, the vaccine is a, a government conspiracy and whatnot. So he refused to take any vaccines. And we keep calling him and say, hey, you have a precondition of asthma that you suffer from when you're young, so you have to be careful, get your vaccine. And be and hold, one day he caught COVID. And to cut the story short, he almost died from it. So he went, he checked himself to um, emergency room and and he survived by God's grace. And some of you have already prayed for him together too. Okay. I'm not just talking about COVID right now. There are just many areas in our world that we are not able to see what the truth really is because the information that we see seems to be the absolute truth. Okay. The another uh, devastation that caused by social network is social network, the name itself means it brings relationships together. That's why it was created in the first place, right? Across the distance, across time, we can come together, but actually it's breaking relationships. Biased mind results in disconnect in our lives. And we spend so much time on this massive information just influxing everywhere. And also, it's disconnecting our relationship with our families, with one another, even with God. Even their worship during the time with God, right? Quality time is taken away. And here we don't have many young people here, but you know, like at a dinner table or wherever, even when we meet someone in a cafe, I just met with this person. I've spent walking to cafe to meet this person, but then we pull out our phone and we check our phone instead of looking at each other. I'm like, what are we doing, right? All these moments, quality time is taken away from our families, our gatherings, okay? And our God is God of relationships. So relationship is very, very important with one another and with him. And also the self-image, because so much information is coming in, we lose the true self-image that we have. In other words, we lose our self-identity. Okay. Did you know that among children, um, the number one request at a plastic surgery is like, oh, I want to look like so-and-so or, you know, him or her, right? But our children today, they go to this plastic surgeon and ask, make me look good in my selfies. Who cares about the selfie? You might hate me for saying this, right? But it's not your real representation, right? You see, because our identity, our image is valued by how many likes that you get on your postings, that determines who you are. That's what's happening to our young people today. For example, they will say, I'm not good enough if I don't get enough pins or hearts or like it, right? But what about us? There's so much information, there's so much photos, so much things, life values that are just thrown at our life right now. And you're seeing all of that, right? What is the value of life that you pursue today? What is the standard of evaluation of my happiness? Let us really examine this. Our own evaluation will prevent us sometimes from seizing heaven in our lives. 
The Garden of Eden is right here. We might not be able to enter because of we depend on our own evaluation. And that's exactly what happened to the Israelites. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, these Israelites with the promised land of Canaan right before their eyes, they said, nope, we ain't going in there because they're giants. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilims. And they evaluate themselves. Nobody told them they are grasshoppers, but they told themselves, we became like grasshoppers. Look at this. In our own sight. And so we were in their sight. People are worried about what other people think about me. And we judge ourselves. We evaluate ourselves. Here, there's no place about God's sight. What are we basing our life by today? Brothers and sisters, we cannot let ourselves be measured by the world. The only true measurement standard comes from the word of God. When we say we are not good enough, we are grasshoppers. God tells us in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 1. Shall we read this together? Ready, begin. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Redeem, remember, does not only mean rescue. Redeem means to rescue me. He changed place with me. There's a price paid for, right? That's how precious we are because we belong to him. And verse 4 says, because you are precious in my eyes. That must be the absolute truth. It doesn't matter how we evaluate myself or one another. That's not the absolute truth. God says, in my eyes, you are precious. And in my eyes, you are honored. And I love you. I give men in return for you. Peoples in exchange for your life. That is the truth. And Jesus himself said, you are my father's children. Okay. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Jesus told us, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. When Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, his spirit, because he has already paid for our sins, because he already swapped with our place of death. He has given us the spirit. And because of that, we can call Almighty God, even though we are not worthy, Abba, our Father. Brothers and sisters, this is our true identity. We must know that, live by it. Therefore, our children can also know it and live by it. Let us not have any longer identity crisis, all right? Nothing in this world can tell us who we are. Satan will use that. Psalm 82, verse 6, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. then how do we know this is the truth versus what Satan said? You'll be like God. Sounds the same, doesn't it? It's all about whether you are connected with him or not. When I become great, he will disconnect me from God. Our connection, when we are sons, means we're connected, right? The sons look like the father because we're connected. This is who we are. And Satan will do everything in his power to overturn this, okay? So when we are connected to him, we can do all things in Jesus Christ. Let's read this together. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Okay, ready? Begin. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things and make connected. And this is a very famous um, example that our founding pastor always used, so I brought this here. He 
he asked, why do you wear glasses? Okay, and by your answer, we can tell how much I can do all things in Christ. Okay, how much positivity that we have in our lives. Why do we wear glasses? A lot of people say, because I can't see. Okay, but founding pastor said, nope, that's the wrong answer. Why do you wear glasses? To see better. Okay. What is the grace of truth then? The grace of truth in conclusion, as we are saying, that we are from God. Okay. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, you are from God. Let's read this together. Ready, begin. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen? Satan will seize the whole world. He's always had. But the one who is in us is greater than he. Okay? So he is in you, that means we need to be able to hear his voice. Amen? If God is in us, we have to be able to hear his voice. We must be able to discern what is his voice and what is not. And his practice. Can you hear the truth? Because remember, you will surely die and you will surely not die. So this world will have comforting lies. And most of people here will follow this comforting lies. Right? Nobody wants to go to the unpleasant truth. Can you hear his voice? Even if it's unpleasant truth, would you choose and hear that voice? Because the end of the world warns us that in the end time, you have to be able to hear his voice. Okay? In book of Revelation, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is how the book of Revelation begins. In the end time, in the apocalypse, the Spirit will begin to speak to where? To the churches. That's why we have to be a part of a church. It's already been programmed this way in God's redemptive history. The Holy Spirit will speak to churches. Okay? And so there are seven churches in Asia Minor. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, the first church that appears is Ephesus, the church of Ephesus, right? And then Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, Smyrna. And Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, Pergamum. And Revelation chapter 2, verse 29, Theatura. Revelation chapter 3, verse 6, Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 13, the Church of Philadelphia. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 22, Laodicea. The Holy Spirit will speak to the churches, and those who have ear will hear. So we must train our ears to discern Father's voice. So that we can go to paradise. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 says this. Let's read this together. Ready, begin. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. It all starts from hearing the voice of our Father God. Okay. So I want to end with this question. There are going, is going to be a lots of information surrounding us. Okay? Many thoughts, many ideas, information, knowledge. What will it be? Will you live by God's voice? Or will you live by your own voice? When I listen to myself and I listen to us, there's so many us. So many us. We leave out Father. We leave out Father's word. We leave out Father's sight. We leave out Father's voice. And I pray that this will 
become a turning point in our life that with our own strength we can, but in Christ Jesus we can, right? So let us become the ambassador of heaven. And we first practice to let go of all our eyes in our lives, empty ourselves, so we can fill us with his voice. So we are able to train our ears and recognize his voice. Amen. So let us be successful in our journey together. And I pray we will see all of us in paradise of our Father God. Amen. So what will you live by? Truth and lies. Right? At first, it will become blurry. Okay? And it will become clearer and clearer as a heart is set on it. Right? And we will recognize, clearly see what the truth and what the lie is. Amen? Because Father's word is a truth. And your amazing Father is feeding you with his word every day. Okay? So let us read this and close. Ready, begin. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And this is a prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Father's word is the truth. May you always be filled with the word of the Father. To be filled, please, let us let go of me, I, our thoughts, our words, and focus on Father's thoughts, Father's words, Father's sight. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you so much. Jesus said, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Father, we humbly stand before you. Please help us and circumcise our ears so we do not lend our ears to the lies and only recognize your voice to discern the truth. Father, we have lived to magnify ourselves, but help us and teach us and train us so we, that we can magnify you in every moment in our life. We commit ourselves to you and we praise you. You are our good Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father. Amen.